Hi guys, so I'm excited to say that Mike the Vegan, a prominent vegan YouTuber, actually reported on the recent experiment that I did with Drew Morgan, uh, where Drew Morgan was actually able to get somebody who was plant-based to go mostly animal-based for 30 days and swap with somebody else who was mostly carnivore, uh, who went entirely plant-based for 30 days. And once I heard about this, I said, okay, you've definitely got to get blood work at the beginning and the end of the experiment. And once we did that, we then reported it on Drew Morgan's live stream. Mike then, of course, picked up this data and actually did his own video analysis. And I thought it was actually a fairly well done production, of course, from a plant centric standpoint. But there were some things in the nuance of my reporting of this that I think a lot of people felt should have been put forward, such as, for example, C reactive protein possibly being impacted by Joe's nighttime job and additional exertion, given that his job was very physically demanding. So a number of people wanted me to do a response video, but response videos. When I think of response videos and the back and forth that typically ensues, I, I think of this. Yep, yep, that's a pretty accurate portrayal. I mean, let's face it, the drama on YouTube is what drives a lot of views, particularly when you see a lot of conflict coming from name calling and not fairly representing the other person's position and oversimplifying things. Truth is, I kind of want a different sort of dialogue when it's out there. So what can I say? I'm going to do this my way, which may not be the typical brand of YouTube. And so maybe I'll get five views, but I'd rather do it the way that's comfortable for me. All right, let's just get right into those numbers. One that is really important and we saw a massive shift in was total cholesterol. Again, this was after 30 days, the guy that went from a vegan diet to high meat diet went from a total cholesterol of 128 to 208. The guy who went from the high meat diet to the vegan diet went from a whopping 222 down to 149. From the guy who went from a vegan diet to the high meat diet started at 47 and exploded up to 119, that's over double. Not looking good, mirrored by the high meat to vegan guy who went from LDL of 156 down to just 82 in just 30 days. That's incredible. Believe it or not, it's actually not that amazing to me. The reason for that, though, is because I've substantially changed my lipid numbers quite a bit over the last three years. It's really core and foundational to my research. And for those people who followed my work, you're already familiar with what I refer to as the lipid energy model, which is the theory by which this goes by. It has less to do with whether you're being powered by plants versus animals. It has more to do with whether you're being powered by glucose versus fatty acids. And thus, if you're on a low carb, high fat diet, you may be trafficking more fatty acids for fuel. And if you are, some portion of that may be along VLDLs, the kind of special lipoprotein that can remodel to LDLs and therefore you'd have more LDL cholesterol. And unlike a lot of metrics that we'll see, these are definitely not just natural random fluctuations. Like you don't just have a random 74 point drop in LDL cholesterol, it doesn't happen. And certainly now you could understand why I agree. While there are many things that can change around your cholesterol levels, nothing in my opinion will change it quite as dramatically and as fast as shifting around your metabolic pathway. And I demonstrated this in an experiment last September. Now what you're looking at is a 296 LDL cholesterol, which of course is considered extraordinarily high. This was the number that I had on 9-20 of 2018 last year. The very next day, it had dropped to 233, then down to 198, then down to 160, 147, 102, and then finally to 83. That's a drop of 213 milligrams per deciliter in seven days. So how did I do this? Well, I wanted something that was low fat and high carb, but actually still included plenty of meat, but was still pretty much a diet nobody would recommend. White bread and processed meat, with just a few vitamins down there in the bottom right to keep me from dying of malnutrition. Yes, believe it or not, just dry white bread sandwiches with lean turkey or ham meal after meal, day after day, was all it took to bring my LDL cholesterol down substantially. And of course, the original video was on a, a pro meat channel. They had a cholesterol denier guy there who was trying to make the case that much higher LDL actually increases longevity. These are everybody who lived to 100 and were still alive at last check in 2015, which is the last 
piece that they had the data and all of them have high LDL cholesterol, 130 to 229. A Feldman guy looked at five centenarians who had high cholesterol, therefore proving that if you up your cholesterol, you have a better chance of living to 100. First, remember the study I just mentioned, not a good strategy for people under 45, no matter what. And second of all, this is a population statistics issue. When you have a population where everybody's cholesterol levels are too high, statistically, some people, some lucky ass people will make it through and become centenarians. It's like if you had thousands of people running through a field where arrows were raining down. Yeah, a few people will make it through. That doesn't mean that showering yourself in arrows every morning is gonna be healthy. All right, I got my shampoo ready to shower. I'm just gonna turn on the arrows real quick. <laughs> Okay, I don't care if you're not a Mike the Vegan fan. That was funny, you need to own it. But there is an important problem with this argument. Let's repeat this clip real quick. When you have a population where everybody's cholesterol levels are too high, statistically, some people, some lucky ass people will make it through and become centenarians. But that's the thing. This actually isn't just those people with high LDL. This is the entire data set. It's actually pretty straightforward. All eligible in Haines data made available that include both cholesterol and mortality comes to 42,590 people. And the years 1999 to 2015 are the ones that have been published. And since they capped testing at age 85, only those tested in 1999 could have made it to age 100 alive. And these are the centenarians. The only modifications I've made is taking out to those records that didn't have complete lipid data and those that had triglycerides above 400 so that we could properly calculate LDL with the Friedwald equation. Which brings us to the key question. How many in inhanes were participating in 1999 who were age 84 or 85? 124. And while that was a wide variety of different lipid profiles, how many of those were verified to be alive in 2015 and of age 100 or later? Five. These five. In full intellectual honesty here, I don't believe that these five centenarians prove high LDL causes greater longevity. This is epidemiology after all, and it's actually very hard to prove causation, even if you're going by Bradford Hill. But all of that said, epidemiology is good at helping to disprove existing expectations, existing hypotheses, because you don't expect to see something in reverse. And actually, I could give you a pretty simple example. Let's say that the only centenarians that were found in the same group of 124 were all two-pack-a-day smokers. That's certainly something we wouldn't expect, and it is something that would get us to start looking a little bit closer at the data to better understand it. Now, I will say I did get inspired while making this video to go ahead and keep going stepwise down each of the ages, so 99, 98, 97, all of the other centenarians. First up, we have those who are exactly 99, or at least 99 and have not yet reached 100. And in this category, we have three people. One of those people has low LDL, 77. Ironically, they're sharing it with two other people that have very high LDL, 152 and 187, respectively. Next up are those that were exactly 98, of which one was 55 and the other eight were 100 or higher, with the highest being at 186. Then we have those who are 97. Okay, this is getting a little unwieldy. That's better. Now we're just gonna go with graphs. You can see there's 21 different data points and we're gonna go ahead and divide this between those that are under 100, considered as optimal LDL cholesterol, and we see there's five. And those that are considered as high LDL cholesterol, they have 100 or higher, and there's a total of 16. And now for the surviving 96 centenarians, there are 10 in the optimal LDL group, 22 in the high LDL group. And then finally, we have those who are 95, for which there are 10 in the optimal LDL group and 22 in the high LDL group. This is identical groupings as the, the 96 tenarians. Let me just double, yeah, yeah, checks out. What are the odds? Now, of course, there is a flaw to this. We're comparing absolute numbers to absolute numbers. Maybe it's possible there are just less people who have lower LDL. Therefore, we want to actually look at what the survivability is within the group itself and compare both of those. So what I did was I basically just took a lot of the tenarian data I just showed you and threw it all together so that I could actually just look at this in the aggregate. Basically, I wanted to get everybody age 84, 85, and 1999 to 2005 in Haines still surviving by 2015. So they have at least a decade to try to reach the longevity. And I found some pretty interesting numbers. Of those with an LDL below 100, there were 19 that were alive and 185 that had deceased, giving it a 10% survival. 
But of those with an LDL of 100 or higher, there were 51 alive, 411 that were deceased for a 12% survival. I also decided to try doing this while excluding statins, since they of course can be a confounder in that there could be an artificial reason somebody would have low LDL. So I wanted to look at people with naturally low LDL versus naturally high LDL, at least as it stood at the time that their blood was taken. And it was interesting, of those that had an LDL below 100, 9 were alive, 139 had died for a survival of just 6%. But of those with an LDL of 100 or more, it was 41 alive, 391 for a 10% survival. Now before any LDL skeptics start doing a victory dance, I really want to emphasize a point that a lot of people on the pro-lipid lowering side will bring up, which is reverse causation. The idea that some people who are really close to death may have their LDL go down for other reasons, such as some forms of cancer, is something that I think is worth examining. So I went ahead and took one more step that brought the line a little bit back and that was actually eliminating everybody who died within five years of having their blood drawn. So you had to live at least two five years and then any mortality past that point would count. This brings it a bit closer to parity. Now there's those with an LDL below 100 with nine alive and 57 deceased and a survival of 16% versus those with an LDL of 100 or higher, 41 alive, two of five deceased, 20% survival. But even so, there's still a fairly significant gap. I realize this kind of real-time data mining is not something a lot of people are used to. What we're used to is I have some studies I flash, you have some studies you flash, and kind of rinses and repeats forever. But the downside of these studies is that you typically don't have access to the raw data. You can't really look under the hood. And the downside of that is you don't know how much the data was at one point when it started versus how it looks now. A lot of times it makes these clean looking graphs that can seem somewhat suspect. But you don't tend to see that level of dramatic curation with public data sets because it is something for which there's a great deal more accountability. A lot of people sharing the same data uh, have a lot more ability to check each other's work. I, I like to call it instead of peer review, it's like public review. And in that regard, you can check my work, obviously. I've used very simple methodologies which um, I describe in this video. And I definitely welcome that because I think it should be much more of a conversation about data that we have in front of us on the table. And for what it's worth, I really do want to apply this to other major data sets like say Framingham Offspring or Women's Health Initiative or Pure for that matter. And I think that we'll really get a lot further in being able to answer this question the more that we can do this in a transparent fashion. So in closing, I'll have to concede I was a bit reluctant to make this video because I feel like oftentimes people get painted as being a part of one tribe and therefore they're a natural opposition with another tribe and that's unfortunate because I, I feel like diet sometimes overshadows this question on cholesterol. And let me just be very clear, as far as diet goes, I think if you're on a diet that's nutritionally complete and your blood work looks great, you feel good around the clock and you don't have some intolerance that's involved, then that could be the diet that's for you. Um, I've said several times, including at a carnivore conference, that I have some vegan friends who have blood work that looks excellent, in my opinion. And for what it's worth, I'm actually proud of the fact that while it's mainly low carbers that come to me for help on their lipids, I've had some vegans that have come to me for help on their lipids. And of those vegans, it's usually in the area of high triglycerides. I'm proud if I've been able to help them to stick with the diet that they're already on. I think that that's what's important, is, is empowering people to be able to do what it is uh, that's working for them. And, and that's why it's a bit unfortunate to me that uh, the question of cholesterol can sometimes kind of cloud this larger debate that's um, got a lot of collateral damage coming over from the nutrition side. And just to close this out, Mike, if you are ever in town in Las Vegas, we have some great vegan restaurants. I'd love to take you to dinner and we could chat about it.